here with uh, Jason McClellan, Associate Professor of Molecular Biosciences at here at UT. Uh, Jason, thank you for being with us today and, and uh, talking about COVID-19. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess just to start off, wh when did you first start working on coronaviruses in general? Yeah, we started working on coronaviruses uh, I think back in around 2014. And so we were really interested in the, the structure and function of the coronavirus spike protein, which is the, uh, the white molecules in my background there that decorate the surface of the coronavirus virion. And the goal was to try and understand how they functioned, what their structure was, then use that information to rationally design vaccine antigens. And when did you pivot to COVID-19 specifically? Uh, so that was just as soon as we found out it was a, the, the respiratory pathogen that was circulating in uh, Wuhan at the end of December was a beta coronavirus. When did you start realizing that this COVID-19 was as serious as it is? When was that moment for you? Probably be somewhere around late January when the number of Chinese cases seemed to just keep increasing exponentially and they had to switch to very extreme uh, quarantine measures in order to get it under control. That made it seem like it was going to be different than uh, the SARS coronavirus, which emerged into the human population in 2002, as well as the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, or MERS-CoV, which emerged in 2012. Uh, SARS only infected around 8,500 people total. MERS is around 2,500 people. Uh, and this is already obviously completely blown past that. Can you explain, I guess, to the layperson like myself, uh, what what is exactly the spike protein is and why you have been mapping it? Yeah, so I have a little 3D model of it. Let's see, put it in front of me. So that's the structure of the spike protein that, that we determined. So we know where all the helices and beta strands, where every residue in this molecule is. That helps us determine uh, its function, how it binds to the receptor, uh, how it fuses the membranes, and that's really the, the, the critical role. So the coronaviruses, like many other viruses, have a, an envelope, a, a lipid bilayer that surrounds them. In my background, that's like the, the reddish part of the coronavirus. And our cells also have a lipid bilayer. And in order for the, the virus to infect our cells, the two membranes have to fuse with, with each other, because otherwise they're serving as, as a barrier. And so the spike protein performs two major functions. It's the molecule that recognizes specific receptors on our cell surface. So it, it attaches the virus to our cells via, in this case, the ACE2 receptor. And then once it's attached, the spike protein undergoes this really large conformational change that then fuses the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. And then it allows the context of the, the contents of the virus and the contents of the cell to mix. And so at that point, then the, the viral genome enters the cytoplasm of our cells, and then there starts the trans, uh, transcription and replication process. The cell is then infected, and the virus hijacks it to make more copies of itself, which then butt out. So that's the, so the spike protein is absolutely critical for, for entry, doing both the attachment and the membrane fusion portions. You mentioned uh, MERS and SARS, uh, other coronaviruses. What makes this virus so different and so much worse? I mean, it's obviously been much worse. Yeah, SARS causes uh, about 10% of the infected people to, to die. So it's like a 10% case fatality rate, which is about maybe 10 times higher than this coronavirus. And MERS actually has a 35% a case fatality rate. So those are actually some of more, more lethal viruses, but they don't spread as easily. Uh, and and that, that's the big difference with this coronavirus is that the human to human transmission is extremely high. Uh, we see uh, obviously many people being infected. Fortunately, it's killing roughly only 1% or so of people, maybe, maybe less. It also varies by age. Um, but that's a lot less than the 10% or 35%. Uh, why that is, is probably going to take years to, to understand um, what, what molecule, what, what proteins, what changes in the, in the viral genome are responsible for that. And it's likely to be many different uh, components sort of coming together. Uh, these viruses have large genomes, many different proteins that they express. And uh, it's, it's probably going to be a, a complex answer as to why this one has higher transmissibility. 
and we've seen various timelines floated for that vaccine. Um, I think a popular one is people have said 18 months. Do you have yeah. an idea of when we might realistically see a vaccine? Uh, the 18 to 24 month time frame is, is a very good estimate. Uh, it would be incredibly fast by any historical standard. Uh, I think within 65 days of the genome sequence being released, we were already part of a phase one clinical trial. Uh, so, so that's really quite incredible. Uh, so that's a partnership with, with us and the NIH and a company called Moderna. Uh, they're able to develop an mRNA-based vaccine expressing the stabilized spike antigen that we designed, and that was injected into humans, I think, March 16th. So that, that's really unheard of uh, to go that quickly into a phase one. And then a phase two might be later this year. That's generally in the order of like hundreds of people, still mostly looking for, at safety although you can start to get some, some estimate of efficacy. And then finally, you need a multi-thousand person phase three clinical trial. Uh, we have one arm receiving placebo, another arm receiving the actual vaccine. You have to wait for natural infection to occur, uh, compare the two groups, see if the vaccine has, has prevented severe disease. And so all that just, just takes time. It, it, there's no real way, way to, of going quicker. There's no magic button to say, let's just do this faster, let's cut the red tape. and. Uh, I mean, you could always cut the red tape at the risk of it not doing anything or having uh, unintended side effects. I think there's already enough concern about vaccines, you know, unwarranted concern, but we certainly don't want to create a vaccine that has any substantial side effects. What's it like on campus right now? Obviously, you're still there. Um, is it weird to see this sort of empty campus? Are people social distancing in, in, a, in a correct way? Oh, yeah, there's just nobody here. It's, uh, it, it, it's like a ghost town. It's pretty interesting. I mean, traffic's fantastic. I can get to work in like 20 minutes compared to 35, and I can park almost anywhere. Uh, so, so that's been helpful. Um, but yeah, like it, it's just a totally different vibe. It, it's not great. Um, I like seeing all the students around, having shops open and things like that, being able to walk the torches. So, so it, 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 it's a lot different. Um, as someone who's tackling this problem right now, do you have any words of encouragement for people watching this who are obviously freaked out? Uh, I think a lot of us are about what's coming or what's, yeah, what's here and what's coming. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the thing, see, let's see, uh, to be somewhat uh, apprehensive about is that we really haven't had that many infections in, in Austin. You know, you're seeing like New York really, really get hammered. Um, it's kind of go, going to go by city by city. And so at least Austin and, and many of the cities in Texas, we, we really haven't had uh, a major sort of outbreak where the, the cases are doubling every three days. Uh, so, so I think our, our peak is still to come. Uh, so that's, an, uh, that's a reason to, to keep practicing the social distancing measures. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I'm pretty hopeful. We know a lot about coronaviruses in general. Uh, we, I personally feel really good about the, the vaccines and antibodies and small molecules that are in development. Uh, everybody's really trying to push this forward, getting tremendous um, uh, help and donations from like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They're going to help scale up like seven different vaccine candidates and get those manufactured rapidly. So hopefully, uh, I mean, 18 months is, is, is a long time. and uh, but but I'm optimistic we'll we'll have something uh, that can help thwart this outbreak. All right, thank you for your time today, Jason. We appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks, thanks so much, Chris. Enjoy talking to you.